You know the stephanus that marked on the edge, right? <clears throat> sure. Okay. Uh, I think it's agreed. Please check. Uh, 27C looks like it's a new departure point, which is on page blah blah blah. <laughs> Two fifty seven in the lobe. Okay. Would you agree just to pull things together a little bit? The apparent problem is Philebus is holding the position that the good life is pure pleasure. And Socrates is saying, No, no, no. Mind and everything involved in mind. That's where it starts. And what's interesting is that to decide on this issue, <clears throat> Socrates raises the question of, in what class do you put these things? And what? Yeah. Which can be said to advance or be the good life? Pure pleasure? Or mind stuff. He said, no, we're not gonna we're gonna we're not gonna be able to do that. We're not gonna be able to understand that unless we can take a look at this question. In what class do these things belong? Which is really curious. To decide this, he says, hey, we got to do this. Because after all, they are going to be members of some class, but why it follows that by exploring this issue you can decide on this question is the heart of the dialogue. So would you agree? He says, ah, I'll tell you what, um, <clears throat> pleasure. Right. always admits of more and less. It's a whole bunch of stuff that fits in the more and less, which he calls, or I call, the ER class. Right. Greater, lesser, or ER, more or less. He's the flesh boy, but therefore belongs in that class. And it's, a, it's unlimited. It's an unlimited class or infinite class. And just, you know, um, there's another class, a finite. Yeah, there's a finite class. And um, like hotter and, hotter and colder, hotter and colder, <coughs> any ER. Once you once introduce number into this, then you have a new class of finite things. Yes, but you know, when you mix these two together, you have a mixed class. And that allows you to speak of order, harmony, So therefore, there's one class, two, three, and then he pulls this one. He says, by the way, anything that exists must have a cause. Ah, fourth class. So that's where we're at. All right, one, two, three, four. These are the four classes. What's he going to do? He's going to try to solve the problem of which is the better life <laughs> by using these curious four classes. Agree? Anyone want to add anything to that? Please do so. So, uh, here, therefore, we have a nice review of the classes. See whether you go along. <clears throat> I 
I'm at uh, 27B about, is it then proper, now that we have distinguished the four, to make sure that we remember them separately by enumerating them in order. Now, I want to focus on that curious word, in order, right? Put them in the right order, not just set them out, in order. First, then, I call infinite the class, right? I call the first, then, I call infinite. The second, limit or finite. And the third, something generated by a mixture of these two. And should I be making any mistake if I call the cause of this mixture the fourth? One, two, three, four, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly not. Now, what is the next step in our argument? Right, what is the next step in our argument? And what was our purpose in, in coming to the point we've reached? Was it not this? We were trying to find out whether the second place belonged to pleasure or wisdom. Right? Because they're going to give up, they're going to give prizes to these. Right? Well, maybe you can't give pleasure the prize because pure pleasure just by itself, right? Least that's like being an oyster, right? Because that means you have no recollection of the pleasure you're having. You can't appreciate it or enjoy it or anything. It's just pure pleasure. Therefore, it's dull. It's like living like an oyster. So it can't take first place. Maybe it can take second prize. Maybe it takes second prize. Or maybe third. Or maybe fourth prize. We were trying to figure out whether the second place belonged to pleasure or should it belong to uh, mind, stuff, or wisdom. Which should get the second prize? And may we not perhaps, now that we have finished with these points, be better able to come to a decision about the first and the second places, which, by the way, was the original subject of our discussion, because we want to give prizes to which is the higher and the better life. All right. So we've got these four classes. Well, then, we decided that the mixed life of pleasure and wisdom was the victory, did we not? When you mix these two together, that's the mix, that's what you need. Yes. And do we not see what kind of life this is and uh, to what class it belongs? Yeah, 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 yeah. Belongs to the third class, right? The mixed is the third class, right? So far. Fair enough, so if we get a couple of readers, go by our usual rule. If you want to stop it for any reason, just blow the whistle or raise your hand. We can stop and talk about it. So we pick it up from there. Yes, yes, need a couple of readers to play? Okay, let's get a volunteer. Good. Mark and Barbara. Do you agree Barbara is a good volunteer? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Barbara, are you a good volunteer? I am. I'm good. Okay. I'm now, a good volunteer. Now, wait a minute. But you also do a lot of other work, so make sure that you can do both together. And if it, well, I noticed this gentleman. I think it's modesty has been holding him back. You do. You For think fear that reading two nights in a row, row we might would be, be too much. Would be too much. We would yeah. a, be astounded at his arrogance. But yeah. it's not the case. We'd rather yeah, hear him read. It's nice of you to consider the, the goodness of his soul. Yes. Yeah, yeah. When he might get pleasure playing that role. Yes, he might. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my thought is, uh, our friend here might read, and I would have more focus. <laughs> You're in. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay, well, no, let's play. Sure Hold it. Read, but you know, yeah, is that a hand? Quick clarification. Um, when he talks about the cause, if you're doing it in the terms of like an explanation, or yeah, I'd say yes. If you keep going, and I hope to say yes to the next part. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, that cause is not what he calls the good. 
Oh, I, I don't know. I didn't get that far on the book. Yeah. I don't remember if he... <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, it's something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But that's a good guess, but it might not be. I suspect it might not be. We'll find out very quickly. You got our team to go? Mm -hmm. You want to come up and do it, or how, where do you feel best? Because we're shooting it. Come on. Come on. Okay. Come on. Mark. Come on. Can we grab a seat up here, and you do it up here. Then I can be behind you with it. What page are you guys on? What page? Uh, 257. Are we at now? What is the next step? Now, what is the next step in our argument? And what was our purpose in coming to the point we have reached? Was it not this? We were trying to find out whether the second place belonged to pleasure or to wisdom. Were we not? Yes, we were. And may we not perhaps, now that we have finished with these points, be better able to come to a decision about the first and second places, which was the original subject of our discussion? Perhaps. Well then, we decided that the mixed life of pleasure and wisdom was the victor, did we not? Yes. And do we not see what kind of life this is? and to what class it belongs? Of course we do. We shall say that it belongs to the third class, for that class is not formed by mixture of any two things, but of all the things which belong to the infinite, bound by the finite. And therefore, this victorious life would rightly be considered a part of this class. Quite rightly. Well then, what of your life, Philebus, of unmixed pleasure? In which of the aforesaid classes may it properly be said to belong? But before you tell me, please answer this question. Ask your question. Have pleasure and pain a limit, or are they among the things which admit of more and less? Yes, they are among those which admit of the more, Socrates. For pleasure would not be absolute good if it were not infinite in number and degree. Nor would pain, Philebus, be absolute evil. So it is not the infinite which supplies any element of good in pleasure. We must look for something else. Well, I grant you that pleasure and pain are in the class of the infinite. But to which of the aforesaid classes, Protarchus and Philebus, can we now without your reverence assign wisdom, knowledge, and mind. I think we must find the right answer to this question, for our danger is great if we fail. No, oh, Socrates, you exalt your own god. And you, your goddess, my friend. But the question calls for an answer all the same. Socrates is right, Philebus. You ought to do as he asks. Did you not, Protarchus, elect to reply in my place? Yes, but now I'm somewhat at a loss, and I ask you, Socrates, to be our spokesman yourself, that we may not select the wrong representative and so say something improper. I must do as you ask, Protarchus, and it is not difficult. But did I really, as Philebus said, embarrass you by playfully exalting my God when I asked to what class mind and knowledge should be assigned? You certainly did, Socrates. Yet the answer is easy, for all philosophers agree, whereby they really exalt themselves, that mind is king of heaven and earth. Perhaps they're right, but let us, if you please, investigate the question of its class more at length. Speak just as you like, Socrates. Do not consider length so far as we are concerned. You cannot bore us. Then let us begin by asking a question. What is the question? Shall we say, Protarchus, that all things and this which is called the universe are governed by an irrational and fortuitous power and mere chance? Or on the contrary, as our forefathers said, are ordered and directed by mind and a marvelous wisdom? 
two points of view have nothing in common, my wonderful Socrates. For what you are now saying seems to me actually impious. But the assertion that mind orders all things is worthy of the aspect of the world, of sun, moon, stars, and the whole revolving universe. I can never say or think anything else about it. Do you then think we should uh, assent to this and agree in the doctrine of our predecessors, not merely intending to repeat the words of others with no risk to ourselves, but ready to share with them in the risk and the blame if any clever man declares that this world is not thus ordered, but is without order? Yes, of course I do. Then observe the argument that now comes against us. Go on. We see the elements which belong to the natures of all living beings, fire, water, air, and earth, or, as the storm-tossed mariners say, land in sight, in the constitution of the universe. Hmm. Certainly, and we are truly storm-tossed in the puzzling cross-currents of this discussion. Well, here is a point for you to consider in relation to each of these elements as it exists in us. What is the point? Each element in us is small and poor and in no way pure at all or endowed with the power which is worthy of its nature. Take one example and apply it to all. Fire, for instance, exists in us and also in the universe. Of course. And that which is in us is small, weak, and poor. But that which is in the universe is marvelous in quantity, beauty, and every power which belongs to fire. What you say is very true. Well, is the fire of the universe nourished, originated, and ruled by the fire within us? Or, on the contrary, does my fire and yours, and that of all living beings, derive nourishment and all that from the universal fire. That question does not even deserve an answer. <laughs> True. And you will, I fancy, say the same of the earth which is in us, living creatures, and that which is in the universe. And concerning all the other elements about which I asked a moment ago, your answer will be the same. Yes. Who could answer otherwise without being called a lunatic? <laughs> Nobody, I fancy. Now follow the next step. When we see that all the aforesaid elements are gathered together into a unit, do we not call them a body? Of course. Apply the same line of thought to that which we call the universe. It would likewise be a body, being composed of the same elements. Quite right. Does our body derive, obtain, and possess from that body or that body from ours, nourishment and everything else that we mentioned just now? Tad Socrates is another question not worth asking. Well, is this next one worth asking? What will you say to it? What is it? Shall we not say that our body has a soul? Clearly we shall. Where did it get it? Protarchus, unless the body of the universe had a soul, since that body has the same elements as ours, only in every way superior. Clearly, it could get it from no other source. No, for we surely do not believe, Protarchus, that of those four elements, the finite, the infinite, the combination, and the element of cause which exists in all things, this last, which gives to our bodies, souls, and the art of physical exercise and medical treatment when the body is ill, and which is in general a composing and healing power, is called the sum of all wisdom. And yet, while these same elements exist in the entire heaven, and in great parts thereof, and are, moreover, fair and pure, there is no means of including among them that nature which is the fairest and most precious of all. Certainly, there would be no sense in that. Then if that is not the case, it would be better to follow the other line of thought and say, as we have often said, that there is in the universe a plentiful infinite and a sufficient limit, 
and in addition, a by no means feeble cause which orders and arranges years and seasons and months and may most justly be called wisdom and mind. Yes, most justly. Surely reason and mind could never come into being without soul. No, never. Then in the nature of Zeus, you would say that a kingly soul and a kingly mind were implanted through the power of the cause and in other deities, other noble qualities from which they derive their favorite epithets. Certainly. Now do not imagine, Protarchus, that this is mere idle talk of mine. It confirms the utterances of those who declared of old that mind or noose always rules the universe. Yes, certainly. And to my question it has furnished the reply that mind belongs to that one of our four classes which was called the cause of all. Now you see, you have at last my answer. Yes, and a very sufficient one. And he, you answered without my knowing it. Yes, Protarchus, for sometimes a joke is a restful change from serious talk. You are right. We have now then, my oh, friend, my pretty mind. clearly shown to what class mind belongs and what power it possesses. Certainly. And likewise, the class of pleasure was made clear some time ago. Yes, it was. Let us then remember concerning both of, both of them that mind was akin to the cause and belonged more or less to that class and that pleasure was itself infinite and belonged to the class which in and by itself has not and never will have either beginning or middle or end. We will remember that, of course. Our next task is to see and what and by means of what feeling each of them comes into being whenever they do come into being. Okay, we'll hold it for that <coughs> for a minute. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> See, while he's talking about the issue of pleasure and mind, look what he's doing. He's t teaching us or raising the issue of how to make all the distinctions in mind stuff while he's doing all of this work in and out on the issue of pleasure. So look, there are three, three curious issues. And and uh, they're right here. Wisdom, mind, and there is this Greek word, which we're calling it phrenesis, which is variously translated, often translated with this word, wisdom. But it looks like he's making a distinction. So let me ask you, do you have, do you have it clear in your mind from what has been developed? the difference between wisdom and mind? That's no. the issue. No. Because that's what he's doing. Yes. Well, I don't know that either. If I knew that, I might know this, the first question. <laughs> and, by the way, he even sneaks in its combination, which is real clever. But let's hold back that one, all right? So look here. <clears throat> we want to know how he is using this word, wisdom. And every time we use the word wisdom, we want it to express Sophia, right? If it doesn't, we don't want to use the word wisdom. We'll just call it by an anglicized Greek phronesis, right? Now, let's try it. Um, let's go to um, 28DE for a moment, okay, everybody? I'm on page 261 in the low. 
shall be saved, Protarchus, that all things and this which is called the universe are governed by an irrational and fortuitous power and mere chance? Or on the contrary, as our, far, our forefathers said, are ordered and directed by mind and a marvelous wisdom. Right? Mind is the noose, right? But wisdom really is phrenesis. So look here, we have three terms. And so if you wanted to correct it, it would be good just to make a note that the word wisdom is misused there. Now, it may be, by the way, when we get through this, that there's no difference between those two words, and then we'll be wondering why these people use two words that are different to say something that's the same. Right? That'll be later. But right now, we're looking for differences. And this is where in the section where he's making these distinctions. So, would you agree we now have the puzzle? Because I want to know, how do these people look at these three words? Wisdom, mind, and this curious word, phrenesis. All right. Um, now, one other thing. Would you agree central to this whole discussion is the role of analogy? Mm -hmm. By the way, should we put the idea of analogy in here with mind stuff? He doesn't. We will. <coughs> so in the idea of mind stuff, which is intelligence, knowledge, uh, we'll stick in analogy. But look here. What is the analogy? <coughs> that micro, micro, right? In the universe at large, that stands to uh, the human body in a very similar way in the fact that all of the elements of one could be found in the other. But in the body, they're always less and inferior in the universe, greater and more mag magnificent. Right? So he pushes that, doesn't he? That's the kind of reasoning he's using, which is therefore using an element of analogy, which is the way of using and training your mind. Moderns hate analogies. <laughs> and for the most part, they want to reject it from all logic works. If you can open up a work on logic, look up the index, look at the word analogy, and you can see they dismiss it. And they may be right or wrong, but in any case, I enjoy it. Only because of my Uncle Louis's uh, influence in my family. <laughs> okay. We need a couple of good quotes. Okay, where shall we go? I want to see the difference between wisdom and mind from what we've read. Ready? Who should go first? Just a second. Would you agree after the analogy, which is where we're at, um, He then raises a question about the fact that there are similar elements in both the universe and in the body. Agree? And I'm on page 265. Then does our body derive, obtain, and possess from that body, or that body from ours, uh, nourishment and everything else that we mentioned just now? That's Socrates, another question not worth asking. Whoa! So, how about the next one? What? Here it is. As you make all these distinctions between the universe and the human body, he now puts in the idea of soul. And that now we have another term, soul, which I represent with S. So what we need to do is see whether we can pull something out of this nice paragraph. Shall we not say that our body has a soul? Where did it get it? Unless the body of the universe had a soul, since the body has the same elements as ours, only in every way superior. 
hey, he's just sticking soul in the universe and mm -hmm. in the body. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it could get it from another source than the universe. No, 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 no. <clears throat> For we surely do not believe, Petrarchus, that of those four elements, the finite, infinite, the combination, and the element of cause, which exists in all things, this last, which gives to our bodies souls, right, this last, fourth cause. This last does what? Gives our bodies souls. Gives to our bodies souls. The fourth cause gives bodies to our souls. Oh! Okay, so we need one of our readers to pick that one up. Let's go through that paragraph, please. Oh, should I do it? Okay. You want to read it from where? Thank you. Want to do it for us? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> for we surely do not believe, Protarchus, that of those four elements, the finite, the infinite, the combination, and the element, or genos, of cause, which exists in all things, this last, which gives to our bodies souls, and the art of physical exercise and medical treatment when the body is ill, and which is in general a composing and healing power, is called the sum of all Sophia. And yet, while these same elements exist in the entire heaven and in great parts thereof, and are moreover fair and pure, there is no means of including among them that nature which is the fair, most beautiful and most honored or precious of, the, of all. What did you just do? Well, he had a definition of Sophia. That's right. It's the sum of all Sophia. Mm -hmm. Right? Wisdom. We got, therefore, would you not agree, a good quote? Okay. How does well, he use the word wisdom? As a, You mean the composing and healing power? Yeah, what else? Okay. <laughs> Giving the body a soul. The art of physical and medical treatment. See, remember Plato's idea of art, right? Mm -hmm. Central notion, right? A particular kind of knowledge, when applied to a subject, brings about a unique benefit that brings the person to a higher level of being. That and only that is art, right? Not a modern notion of art. So the fourth cause gives soul and the arts of healing. It's a healing power, see? Then that, that is that necessarily that it brings the person to benefit. So the fourth cause does what? It gives soul and all of the arts that bring about man a, be a benefit. Such as a bunch of them? Physical exercise. Doctors. Physical exercise. Seamanship. All the words with ship in it in English, right? <laughs> now watch what he does in the next paragraph. Then if that is not the cause, case, sorry, then if that is not the case, it would be better to follow the other line of thought and say, as we have often said, that there is in the universe a plentiful infinite and a sufficient limit and in addition, a by no means feeble cause which orders and arranges years and season and months and may most properly be called wisdom and mind. Sophia and mind. One more. Surely Sophia and mind could never come into being without soul. Mm. 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 These two things are dependent upon soul. Ah. Ah. Well, 
Uh, we're not finished, thank goodness. We have to go further? Do you go further? Sure. No, thank you. I just had a question. Yeah, let's jump. So when we add noose to it, we're then getting the quality or the uh, functions of um, uh, well, ordering why, why don't and... Why we just hold up for noose just for a little bit? Okay, okay. I was just saying it looks like... Yes, okay. please. No, no, okay. no, That's no. Okay. I don't mean to interrupt you. Okay, I was just saying that it looks like it says... Um, what the, the, He says orders and arranges years and season and months. That Then he adds in noose at that point, which is kind of interesting. He adds it. It isn't yet distinguished away, but those the powers change or the function changes yeah, slightly. Yeah, yeah. And fair? in addition, right, right, you're stressing. Therefore, uh, news has a cosmic function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, it orders and arranges mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. seasons, months. Mm -hmm. right. right, right. In addition, okay. right. So we can put that. And good heavens, we're lucky. It's already there by heaven. Okay, then in the nature of Zeus, you would say that a kingly soul and a kingly mind were implanted through the power of the cause. Yeah. And in other deities, other noble qualities from which they derived their favorite epithets. Keep going. Now do you imagine, Protarchus, that this is mere idle talk of mine? It confirms the utterances of those who declared of old that mind always rules the universe. That's right. Mind always rules the universe. So, mm. see, it's a ruling, as you can see from this beautiful crown. <laughs> right. So, therefore, noose is the ruling, ruling waters, mm -hmm. the cosmos. What's wisdom? Keep in mind, what is it? It gives soul and all of the healing arts. That's mm -hmm. wisdom. Right, right, right. We are into it. The fourth cause. That's what it does. What does it do? It gives soul ah, to the whole universe. The arts, the healing power. I like it. Keep going. Okay. And to my, to my question, it has furnished the reply that mind belongs to that one of our four classes, which was called the cause of all. Now, you see, you have at last my answer. Right. Where do we put news? In the fourth form. Class. Right. right, right. See, moderns use the word mind as if it's the same thing with brain, right? They don't do it. Mm -hmm. Here he's saying, no, 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 no. It has a higher function than just a physiological process within the, with the human body. And uh, we get a little bit more. Okay. Shall I jump down to... Oh, we yes, Patrakas. Okay. For sometimes, sometimes a joke is a restful change. You are right. We have now then, my friend, pretty clearly shown to which class mind belongs and what power it possesses. And likewise the class... You certainly. And likewise, the class of pleasure was made clear some time ago. Yeah, I recall that. Let us then remember concerning both of them that mind was akin to cause and belonged more or less to that class and that pleasure was itself infinite and belonged to the class which, is, which in and by itself has not and never will have either beginning or middle or end. Okay, all right. So, would you agree, while he's talking about the issue of pleasure and mind stuff, he's carefully defining these major and most interesting philosophical ideas, wisdom and mind. Mm -hmm. But we're not any closer to this curious word. Mm -hmm. See, that's the mystery. And, and how and why he does it is another issue. Right. So what's the difference between wisdom and mind here, or wisdom and noose? Pardon me. What's the difference between wisdom and noose, the way he's using it? Well, wisdom, I think, was, uh, brings the arts. 
the arts are all the healing, all the things that have a healing and beneficial function to help man. Mm -hmm. uh, horsemanship, anything we should. Then what's news? The cause. Well, it's the a order. cosmic, it's what orders the heavens, the whole cosmic universe. Okay. Orders, arranges. Mm -hmm. So therefore it's clearly different, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is it fair to say there is no difference, but they function differently? I can't understand that. If there is no difference, how can there be a difference? <laughs> I think, watch, I'm puzzled. <laughs> Help me out. How can they, how can they, how can you hold both? I, I'm, I'm confused to whether I don't know that. Newt I don't is see the, the cause of soul, or that the soul that you you talk about uh, may makes it possible for news to emerge from it. I keep I keep wanting to think in terms of of uh, what comes before and after, and maybe that's well, that second I, time. I don't mind that. Uh, uh, I have to understand your question a little better. So, uh, uh, you're putting it in terms of time. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's really uh, trying to look at a cosmology. So let's not do that. Let's just stay here. Uh, would you agree he comes to the conclusion that uh, <clears throat> that when you add when you add this mixed class you then get a whole bunch of interesting things you get order and harmony right, right. there must be a cause to it must it not you know, Now, uh, is it enough? Is it enough to talk about the fact that the universe and mankind, that we have order and harmony? Do you have to go a step above that when you say, "Wait a minute, uh, there's something beyond both of them. There's something about uh, good health that's more than just ordering and harmony." Uh, because the body gets diseased, gets injured. There's a healing power in the universe. Is that going further than just saying there's an order and harmony? Yeah. Is that the opposite? Watch. Yeah. Let me ask. Uh, is there such a thing as knowledge? <coughs> okay. If there is, can you break it up into two pieces? and say one kind of knowledge doesn't benefit man in any way. Uh, making the chair, the chalk, all kinds of things. Would you agree there's another kind of knowledge like medicine that when applied to a subject makes them better? And that's radically different, different kind of knowledge, isn't it? two different kinds of knowledge. Well, where does this second kind, the healing power come from? Must it go beyond just order then? So, he said, that's another level. That's another psychic level. That's another level. That healing power. You have to say that's beyond just ordering and harmony of the body. Uh, the whole art of, of medicine, midwifery, bringing to birth, nurturing children as an art to bring about the highest excellence. Is that more than just ordering? Mm -hmm. If so, then you have to say, um, how do you account for that? You're saying, well, the origin of that is the same question about the soul. Why? Because if you want to make something better, there's something that has to be there that 
becomes better. The stomach. Yeah, no. What makes a man better? The teeth. No? Right? If we're better, we're better as people, are we not? We become better, not just the organs in our body. Well, what is getting better? He says soul. That's what the word soul means. That's what can get better or worse. Well, where the heck did that come from? Well, in any case, you do agree it's different. You know, so we still have to say, see, are there four classes or maybe five? Maybe we have to ask, what's the source of the soul and the healing arts? And that's one of the arguments no. in the book. Are there really only four classes or could there be five? So wisdom allows us to have the art yeah. that will yeah. cooperate in, in making yeah. the soul. Yeah, right. yeah like if there is a knowledge and someone, right, uh, Sad, is it not? Look at this. Terrible, sad. Mm -hmm. See the person suffering. Right. They tried all the remedies that they can think of, and their uncles and their aunts and their grandmothers, it still didn't help them. Now they got to risk something. They got to go to someone who may know something, and they don't know what they know, but they've heard this guy can uh, look at the same things we look at. We see the same person suffering. Only he understands the symptoms, doesn't he? He reads the symptoms. And he's going to then deal with the symptoms that he sees and suggest a diagnosis, a treatment, so the person then can get better. This person has to say, what? I may have to go through greater pain with your lousy treatment? Uh -huh. Well, people are crazy, therefore, to go to dentists. Unless we're willing to go through more pain now to save us from greater misery later. So if the person does that, then they become a patient and he becomes their doctor and he has a command and has the right to command them to do all kinds of things, doesn't he? They give up their freedom. I know one crazy doctor even asked their patients to stop smoking. When everyone knows it's good for the feet. Isn't it? I would not know about that. You don't know. <laughs> okay, go for it. Step. This is a certain kind of knowledge, isn't it, that benefits the subject. We just don't mean physically. We hope they are better for it. Is it possible that there's a way of becoming better? And what's getting better, your feet or as a person? Health. What the heck are you going to call that? He calls it your soul is getting better. Psyche. Curious word. I don't know. I don't know. There we are, stuck again. I don't know what. Did this help any? Oh, yeah. I'll be darned. No. Yeah. Yeah, well, we should ask people who are really experts on this subject of uh, the arts. Oh, Yanni happens to uh, have gotten into the idea of art, have you not? Right. This is this is the theme, isn't it? This is another level to the idea of art. Yeah. Ion, Republic, etc. Theotides. Enough of my <clears throat> babbling here. Let's go back. Okay, new level, right? New level. He shifts gears now, doesn't he? Our next task is to see in what and by means of what, right, of what feeling, each of them comes into being, whenever they come into being. Wow. What are you going to tell us? Whew. Whole new level. Okay. In what? Hey, in what? These two things now. How do these things come into being? How do these come into being? 
How does pleasure come into being? How does this stuff come into being? Uh, how's it doing? Our next task is to see in what and by means of what feeling each of them comes into being whenever they do come into being. Now we'll take pleasure first. And doing it, of course, we're not going to be able to do it without discussing pain. So he's going to talk about pleasure and pain. What do you want to know? Hey, how does this come into being? How does pleasure come into being? And he's adding pain, isn't he? He's going to do the same thing on this side after he finishes with pleasure. Shall we push? What do you think? Get our team back? Are you good for another? Good. Yes? Good. Come on. Switch roles. I don't care. Um, go ahead. Where do you want to pick We are on page 269. Our next task is to see in what and by means of what feeling each of them comes into being whenever they do come into being. We will take pleasure first and discuss these questions in relation to pleasure as we examined its class first. But we cannot examine pleasure successfully apart from pain. If that is our proper path, let us follow it. Do you agree with us about the origin, the origin of pleasure? What do you think it is? I think pain and pleasure naturally or originate in the combined class. Please, my dear Socrates, remind us which of the aforesaid classes you mean by the combined class. Hmm. I will do so as well as I can, my brilliant friend. Thank you. <laughs> My combined class, then, let us understand that which we said was the third of the four. Right, this one, right, the third one. <laughs> the one you mentioned after the infinite and the finite, and in which you put health and also, I believe, harmony? You are quite right. Now, will please pay very close attention. I will. Say on. I say then that when, in us living beings, harmony is broken up, a disruption of nature and a generation of pain also take place at the same moment. What you say is very likely. But if harmony is recomposed and returns to its own nature, then I say that pleasure is generated. If I may speak in the fewest and briefest words about matters of the highest import. I think you're right, Socrates. But let us try to be more explicit. It is easiest to understand common and obvious examples, is it not? What examples? Is hunger a kind of breaking up and a pain? Yes. And eating, which is a filling up again, is a pleasure. Yes. Thirst again is a destruction and a pain. But the filling with moisture and that which was dried up is a pleasure. Then to the unnatural dissolution and disintegration we experience through heat are a pain. But the natural restoration and cooling are a pleasure. Certainly. And the unnatural hardening of the moisture in an animal through cold is pain. But the natural course of the elements returning to their place and separating is a pleasure. See, in short, if you think it is a reasonable statement, that whenever in a class of living beings, which, as I said before, arises out of the natural union of the infinite and the finite, that union is destroyed, the destruction is pain. 
and the passage and return of all things to their own nature is pleasure. Let us accept that, for it seems to me to be true in its general lines. Then we may assume this as one kind of pain and pleasure arising severally under the conditions I have described. Let that be assumed. Now assume, within the soul itself, the anticipation of these conditions, the sweet and cheering hope of pleasant things to come, the fearful and woeful expectation of painful things to come. Yes, indeed, this is another kind of pleasure and pain which belongs to the soul itself apart from the body and arises through expectation. So you wonder whether we can cut right for a moment? Look, uh, these are, these three people are ignorant in different ways. We talked about that last time, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and we can get a picture of them. Now through the dialogue, during the dialogue, is there a motion? Uh, is there a development? Is there growth? Yes. Can you see it? Uh, does it change the person going through this dialogue? Take Protarchus, so two paragraphs. The one we just read, right, and the preceding one. <coughs> right. um, on page 271, the, Socrates says at uh, C8, the, um, by combined class, then, let us understand that which we said was the third of the fourth. Oh, the one you mentioned after the infinite and the finite in which you put health and also, I believe, harmony. Hey, is he picking it up? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Uh, again, I'd like to go to where we just shortly left uh, on uh, 275, uh, 32D. Well, it's CD. Look at his remark here that we just read. When he, Socrates says, now assume within the soul itself the anticipation of these conditions, the sweet and the cheering hope of pleasant things to come, the fearful and the woeful expectation of painful things to come. Petrarchus. Yeah, indeed, this is another kind of pleasure and pain which belongs to the soul itself apart from the body and arises through expectation. How's he doing? Pretty good. Better. Right? Yeah. Don't Growth. Know. Right? Hey, in other words, if you're making the connection, then if you're going along with him, uh, what might you consider? You're growing? Wait a minute. Is understanding belong in the healing arts? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a guess? <laughs> when it's what? This kind of material. Right? Right. So let's keep in mind, all right, every time we say it. And Philebus comes in too, by the way. Philebus is not like Cephalus in the Republic. Cephalus in the Republic is another level of ignorance. He runs and he never comes back. Philebus stays, so we want to see as this goes on, how does he change? Right? The different levels of it. So I just wanted to throw that in while we were reading. Yeah, I'll cover back, please. You are right. I think that in these two kinds, both of which are, in my opinion, pure and not formed by a mixture of pain and pleasure, truth about pleasure will be made manifest, whether the entire class is to be desired or such desirability is rather to be attributed to some other class among those we have mentioned. Whereas pleasure and pain, like heat, cold, and other such things, are sometimes desirable and sometimes undesirable, because they are not good in themselves, though some of them sometimes admit on occasion the nature of the good. Pretty good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. Go ahead. You are quite right in saying that we must track our quarry on this trail. First then, let us agree on this point. 
if it is true, as we said, that destruction is pain and restoration is pleasure, let us consider the case of living beings in which neither destruction nor restoration is going on and what their state is under such conditions. Hmm. Fix your mind on my question. Must not every living being under those conditions necessarily be devoid of any feeling of pain or pleasure, great or small? Yes, necessarily. Have we then a third condition besides those of feeling pleasure and pain? Certainly. Well then, do your best to bear it in mind. For remembering or forgetting it will make a great difference in our judgment of pleasure. I should like, if you do not object, to speak briefly about it. Pray do so. You know that there is nothing to hinder a man from living the life of wisdom in this manner. Pronesis. Pronesis. You mean with, without feeling pleasure or pain? Yes, for it was said, you know, in our comparison of the lives, that he who chose the life of mind and phronesis was to have no feeling of pleasure, great or small. Yes, surely that was said. Such a man, then, would have such a life, and perhaps it is not unreasonable if that is the most divine of lives. Certainly it is not likely that gods feel either joy or its opposite. No, it is very unlikely, for either is unseemly for them. But let us reserve the discussion of that point for another time, if it is appropriate. And we will give mind credit for it in contending for the second place, if we cannot count it for the first. Quite right. Okay. We quit. Fine. Good place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Time for a cup. Is it already that time? That which does not come into being. Pardon? No destruction. That, that which seems like he's making a distinction between being, the world of being, and the world of becoming. So. That's true. More. Uh, And we could also look at Thomas Taylor. That would really be interesting, wouldn't it? To make sure what he's doing. No destruction, no restoration is going on for these beings. So what kind of life would it be to live pro phonetically, if I can make up a word, take the word wisdom out of there? So he's talking about a certain way of life, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Now look what he's saying. It would be a, a kind of stasis. It would be without pleasure and pain. Mm -hmm. Ah. A divine life. Yes, and they were going to end up calling that a divine one. You see, right in here, he's telling you what he means by phronesis, so let's stay there. How about Thomas? Got a good quote from Thomas Taylor, please, on the same section? <coughs> What's the step on? Raphael? 33B. Uh, 33B? Yes. You could even back up to uh, 32E. Mm -hmm. 32E? Oh. Yeah. So at 32e, if then what we agreed is to be true, that animal bodies feel pain when anything befalls them, tending to their destruction, pleasure when they are using the means of their preservation, let us now consider what state or condition every animal is in. When it is neither suffering, not that tends to be its destruction, nor is engaged in any action or in the midst of any circumstances tending to its preservation. Give your earnest attention to this point. I say, give your earnest attention. He's making a big point. Give your earnest attention to this point, God. And say, 
whether it is entirely necessary or not, that every animal at that time should feel neither pain nor pleasure in any degree, great or small. It is quite necessary. Besides the condition that an animal is provided, and besides the opposite condition, condition of it under uneasiness, is not this a different, a third, state or condition of an animal? Without dispute. Be careful then to remember this judgment of ours. For on the remembering of it, or not, greatly will depend our judgment concerning the stature of pleasure. But, to go through with this point, let us, if you please, add a short sentence more. Say what? You know, nothing hinders a man who prefers the life of wisdom from living all his life in that state. So, he's staying with the same problem, using wisdom. So, so curious. Just hold it, John. To say that um, it's in the next paragraph, or well, the one. Yes, for it was said, you know, in our comparison of the lives, that he who chose the life of mind and wisdom was to have no feeling of pleasure. At that point, and, uh, sorry, even above that, where he says, living the life of wisdom, what's interesting is that the, those are both verbs, or all three are verbs. Phronane, noane, mm -hmm. phronane, which I think it, it implies that the, it, it is in the use of that capacity you know, the activity of it? Yeah, I don't know. Keep talking. Well, only that the word wisdom, uh, aside from other things, doesn't, it, it implies almost an un... Well, doesn't it sound like a, a quality or something, or a thing, or a noun? This is an action, Actually. right? And, and yes. I guess... Uh, yes. Yes, which is so why you call it such a life. Go ahead. Right. Well, I just wanted to say that it's such a life, and the fact that it, that you were saying, we were talking about understanding being healing, and, and, and the, the kind of work we were doing in the, analyzing the text. So I was on the mm -hmm. theme of um, using the mind, and that's what this is. This is using the phronetic, phronesis abilities and using <coughs> you know, the noose, mm -hmm. being in the process of it. That is what is the... the um, that state of mind is the state of mind without pleasure and pain that's going to have other qualities later. I don't know. It seemed no, 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 no. very significant to me at the Come time. You don't, you don't, you Why I'm working at it, discovering. But for everything he's saying, he's saying this idea uh, is going to get second place. What's first? The mix. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. One, one other question here. Um, earlier, um, can you say anything about this page, line? Page, page, uh, 267. Oh, uh, 267. Yeah, 30, Hold it. 30, C9 or something like that, C10. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Surely, reason and mind could never come into being without soul. Yeah. Well, um, I was just wondering if you could say anything else about that, because it seems strange to have a cause, right, that without its effect or its uh, yeah, effect, right, couldn't, I don't, that's just really striking me. Um, it's so strange. Sophia and Noose. Okay, Sophia and Noose could never come into being without the soul. Yeah, it's just, um... So, uh, first of all, you've, you've got a very good question, right? <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, perhaps, perhaps we have to uh, take this word out. Because it has so many associations. Right? Maybe we should try to build it up from the text. Uh, 
Like, would you not agree, if you just take a look at what he's saying in this passage, it's very curious. And I think you're stressing the curiosity of it, are you not? Look, like, um, we could say that fourth cause, the healing power, why put in it so? Yeah, and why right. it can't come into being without soul? Yeah. 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 Well, that was the answer. See, what, uh, what, so I put in S, S, I didn't want to use the word soul, just to stress it. So, like, um, <clears throat> uh, can there be, can there be this, to use this example here, Medicine could use uh, the art of it, seamanship or other arts, healing arts. <coughs> ben they bring a benefit. Uh, would you not agree there has to be something that is benefited? Sure. Yes. Well, See, the whole, the whole republic, the whole republic is just one question. Uh, if, there, if there is such a thing in Socrates' language, he says, I am a midwife. My mother is the great midwife. I midwife men who are pregnant with ideas. She, mid, she midwives women who are laboring with child, right? Bring to birth, etc. All the processes of birthing. He saw the same kinds of processes I deal with when I'm bringing to birth ideas. Right. Um, is philosophy an art? I think so. See, the Republic is going to go to the end, in the end of Book 9. It's going to go to... Uh, is the study of dreams a healing art? Have you ever um, watched any dream studies? Oh, oh. Well, would you agree it benefits the left foot? <laughs> no, the right foot. <laughs> the, the very center of your being, doesn't it? Right? It, does it not? Yes or no? Go on. What does it do? What is benefited? The self. Whatever that is, that's this. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if it gives S, then S can be benefited, can grow, can develop, can mature, can gain a better way of living. That's where he's going, isn't it? What life is the better life? And that means a better, you end up with a better stomach. Not alone. <laughs> and so he's saying that you need this, you need this S. And if you have this, it presupposes that which is getting better. What do you want to call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm going to get something. I'm dry as a book. I'm going to get something, water or something. Mm -hmm. You guys keep talking. <laughs>